close to the uh, finishing presentations, uh, still in front uh, before, um, I will invite our um, uh, speakers to this stage. Oh, they are already there, but introduce them. Um, I have a few uh, announcements. First of all, we are closer and closer to the evening party uh, of Polish game dev uh, in uh, Manga Museum. Uh, if you are not from Krakow, prepare um, yourself for going in different uh, area of Krakow. Uh, it's not far from here, but still it's good to um, remember the route or something like that. Uh, it won't be very easy, uh, but the place is worth it. Uh, we will have the view, uh, evening view on the Vistula River and Wawel Castle, um, uh, and we will have free beer, um, and uh, we will have the award ceremony. We will uh, present the awards chosen by the journalists for the best Polish uh, mobile game, uh, game as such, and etc. etc. You will see. Uh, this is the fifth time we are doing this, and our awards, as I uh, see, are more and more recognized in the industry. Um, there is a task for you also to be a member of jury. Um, I've asked a few people from the jury from Indie Showcase how many games they have still to play, and they have many of them to, 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 to play, uh, but you can be uh, one of the jury members. We have community vote, so uh, use the link uh, bit.ly uh, slash dd community vote or just ask people participating in, uh, in the showcase or anyone from the crew or look around our social media for this link. Uh, we are waiting for your votes uh, for the best games in Indie Showcase and the level is very high this year. We see uh, plenty of games uh, really uh, in, uh, at very high level of production, arts, uh, game design. Okay. Um, I think that you know uh, who are the sponsors of the Digital Dragons, so uh, if you're not, please look out to your materials, uh, any wall in the whole venue, probably you will find them there. Um, but of course, great uh, thanks to all of them for supporting us um, and for, for all those companies who are participating more in Digital Dragons, like 11-Bit Studios uh, participating in the Indie Showcase as a main uh, sponsor. Okay, this is it. Uh, now it's time for our next presentation. Uh, at this stage, this will be the first duet. Uh, we had just keynote speakers, but now we have Kasper Szymczak and Paweł Kroenke from Creative Forge Entertainment, and their talk has a very um, uh, interesting and um, uh, interesting topic, uh, hardware, so how luck was quantified. Uh, if you are intrigued with this title as I am, Please join me giving applause to our next presenters, Kasper and Pavel. Hello. Woo, works. Okay. So, uh, hello. Uh, okay. We didn't the presenter notes to work, so hence the paper. Uh, because obviously I didn't learn it by heart. Uh, so uh, the topic of my talk, our talk, uh, sounds a bit narrow. It is somewhat narrow. Uh, it's more of a deep dive, uh, but I'll be talking more about the context and how problems, the design problems in hardware were solved, uh, and not as much on about the system itself. So. For me, it was a huge learning experience to, to, to do this, and I'm, I hope to, to share some of it. Okay, so this is a, a simplified agenda, and us. Uh, yeah, the company name is Creative Forge Games, and uh, uh, how many of you have heard about Hardwest? Oh, wow. Wow, f flattering. Uh, uh, who of you have actually played Hard West? Okay, that's nice. That's, that's quite impressive as well. Uh, okay, so it's a turn-based tactical game about cowboys. You know that. Uh, uh, okay, so if you've all seen the game, I presume we don't have to play the trailer. Anyone willing to see the trailer? Okay. Monsieur, please.
So, uh, Kickstarter, um, Hardware was kickstarted, as you might or might not know, uh, and got solid reception. And I say solid because it wasn't by any means overly ambitious. It was a very safe bet and safely played project. Uh, we couldn't take any chances because the company was a, a bit unstable at the moment, so uh, risks were avoided where they could be, uh, costs were minimized, and that's why hardware was described like this. Uh, the idea was to make a game similar enough to appeal to the same uh, audience, but with enough differences to make it stand out. Uh, uh, because obviously, if it doesn't show, Hardwest is a completely different budget range. Um, but the giant, XCOM, has its flaws. Uh, and a huge disclaimer right here, we're huge fans of Hardwest, uh, of XCOM. <laughs> yeah, actually, actually, I, I like XCOM way more because I didn't have to sacrifice anything in my life for XCOM, so <laughs> hence the, my love for XCOM is way purer, you know. Uh, so anyway, let's let the internet speak. Oh, for one. Okay, yeah, and my hot favorite. So why does that happen? How does XCOM work? The thing is, there is a chance to hit, obviously, and there's a, it's modified by character's aim, weapon circumstances, uh, weapon type, enemy cover, so on, so on, so on. Uh, there's a range of possible damage you can deal. There's a critical, critical chance and a range of uh, critical damage you can deal. So there's a sequence of random rolls that affect the outcome. S and as you could see, part of the internet has a huge problem with random outcome, because uh, random number generators never seem to work the way you expect them to. Uh, some players even say they feel cheated, or they say that it doesn't really fucking work. So because many people, th and that's because many people don't really know how random works. And it, it even, this, this problem even has a name, it's called Monte Carlo fallacy. Uh, and the model Monte Carlo fallacy is the belief that if something happens more frequently now, it will happen less frequently later, uh, and the other way around. So intuition tells us, uh, tells the players to expect that if they miss over and over, they are bound to hit eventually, which isn't true. Uh, so players cry and blame you, the developer, and there's a disconnect between intent and um, planning, realization, and outcome. So you might work hard hoping to net good outcome, um, or you might be lazy expecting poor results, but because of a stack of random factors, uh, the outcome can be random. And so what happens is actually life. Anything can happen. And it's a, you know, it's a big fucking mess. Nothing happens that you expect it to. Uh, Another interesting problem is flanking. And flanking is, uh, the basic idea if in flanking is that if you attack the enemy from, the, from a side, your attack will be way more efficient. You get bonuses and so on and so on. So flanking is cool, but the thing is to flank you have to move, and if you move, you're bound to, you risk uh, activating more enemies. Uh, you, activ you risk activating enemy overwatch. Which is like, you know what Overwatch is? Okay, so uh, Overwatch is enemy counterattack. Okay, so if, so because of that, you refrain from something you fear. You, you refrain from something you know would be good. You refrain from moving, and you refrain from flanking, uh, which would bring you joy. And it is very lifelike, really, right? Because in fear of failure, you fail to have fun, and in fearing life, you fail life. So it's very, very realistic. So effectively, one very safe and fairly efficient strategies are like this: you uh, you skip the whole flanking thing, you keep your keep your distance, you crawl carefully, move 
uh, very slowly. And if you spot an enemy, you fire everything you've got, you wait. When you're done, you move on. So this is also probably the most boring strategy, the very effective one. And all in all, it is, uh, it is motivating the not so daring players to make their, make their game boring by themselves, right? Uh, so our solutions to that were, well, there, there's a whole stack of problems that we got messed up. No, oh, never mind. Well, anyway. <laughs> oh, they scaled it. That's why it doesn't work. Our, our slides are OK. Uh, um, anyway, the, the general idea was this. If you made good decisions, you get good outcome. If you make poor decisions, you get poor outcome. So we made many smaller and bigger changes that made the game work differently. Uh, and part of these fixes uh, went into the lag system. So what's the lag system? So first, let's establish the concept of lag. Or as the famous singer Nestor Alexander Hathaway would put it, what is lag? Uh, humans understand such abstract concepts as lag through stories and examples, right? So like, for example, do you feel lucky enough to pull this off? Or you're so screwed, even good luck won't help you. Or you just literally run out of luck. Based on that understanding, we treat luck like a lot of, lot of physics, like flowing finite energy. And building on the superstitious nature of human, uh, we harness this natural, natural connotation, which although natural is like obviously pure bullshit because there's no such thing as luck. Uh, to form a very playable system, which works like this. Uh, everyone has some level of luck, and uh, when you shoot at someone, they lose luck, and if they're out of luck, they get hit. That's it. That's, that's all that is. OK, it's, it's way more than this, but it, the rest are details. Uh, so it worked. And after, after we made it, we had to communicate the system to, to the players. And for one, we needed a visual aid, obviously. Uh, so everyone knows like it's green, and it could be a, a clover or something more suitable, a horseshoe. And that's what we ended up with. Uh, a side note here, uh, this, this is what we ended up with, and this is the only screen in the game that tells you what, how luck works and the whole system, actually. And we got very, very little feedback that people don't get it. So it, it worked miracles. So I'm going to jump into a short post-mortem mode, uh, give you a couple of examples of what went right and what went wrong with the system. So for one, uh, we made the system exposed, uh, contrary to our, to our initial plan. Uh, I was afraid that uh, exposing it would make the game less understandable. And keeping it on, on the screen actually, actually helped us a lot. Uh, because luck appears simple enough not to be intimidating, uh, although it has a lot of stuff going under the hood. Third, apart from combat, we've got a world map exploration stage uh, where you choose your own adventure. And many of these choices affect combat directly through luck. Uh, we kept the enemy luck levels hidden from the player. Uh, um, and you have to keep track of what is the level of luck of all the enemies you encounter. So it plays a bit like poker, and we didn't get any feedback that players could use um, this information. Uh, no one wanted it to be exposed. 
after we hit it. Um, so uh, there was, we, we started with a problem that you knew that at the beginning of uh, combat stage you couldn't really kill anyone because or hit anyone because you knew their luck was full, obviously, and you had to eat up the luck first. Uh, so we changed that, added, that's the only random factor actually in the whole game. Uh, the starting luck of all the enemies is random, so you never know if you actually can or cannot kill them at once. And after your luck was depleted, you were bound to get shot and again and again. So we made a, a little bit of regeneration uh, when you got hit. So what went wrong? A whole lot of things went wrong. So we had no random number generation. Uh, so we missed all the good stuff that comes with random number generation. Uh, so the game is way more predictable and can be way, m you can calculate your way through, which is good on one side, but it's, th there's not much fresh or surprising after you played it through once. Um, because of luck regeneration, which I mentioned just a second ago, uh, players couldn't really cast abilities which required luck, so we should have made some tiny regeneration at least. The combat is a bit shallowish, so that's one of the uh, you know words of wisdom I got from making this game is that you can you can't never really have enough depth in game, so we, we focused on making it simpler, simple and approachable but somehow, you know, left out the, the deep part and we could add like a lot of it and no one would mind that there's more depth. Uh, because of very simplistic and small numbers in the game, it was very difficult to scatter a uh, balance of like, for example, we had like 40 guns and it was very difficult to make them different because the numbers we were operating on were very small because we wanted the power guns to be very powerful, so they all had to deal almost the same kind amount of damage. Uh, yeah, the asymmetrical overwatch. So we had overwatch for the enemies, we didn't have overwatch for players, and the idea was that, well, the initial idea was that you, did, you, you should have overwatch as well, but enemies would never trigger it. But we didn't have the time to do this, <laughs> So we, we had a lot of flack for not having Overwatch for the player. Uh, it would never work for the player because we'd stop the AI from using it or from running into your reaction shots, but still we had a lot of negative feedback because of, because of the perception of the lack of mechanic on the asymmetric mechanic. Uh, that is, this is actually the same thing as before. I, I messed something up. Sorry, my bad. And oh yeah, there it is. Uh, we we uh, we encounter an emergence of counterintuitive strategies. So the thing is, when you've got one enemy and you know they've got high luck, you know you have to reduce the luck to hit them, right? So players started to tend to use very accurate gun to eat up the luck, and then a very powerful gun, less accurate, to damage the character, right? So this is not exactly intuitive, this, not, well, maybe not exactly counterintuitive as well, but uh, it's, it wasn't natural at all. And the abstract nature of our system kind of hit us in the back. So the reception. Uh, well, the big thing is whenever you see a uh, memes li like like the one I so the ones I showed you about XCOM and the random number generations, uh, someone always mentions Hard West. You know, it's like you know, but in Hard West, it works in a different manner, and you don't have that problem there. Uh, half of the reviewers mentioned the lag system making it the third most mentioned feature, number one being the setting and number two being uh, character development. All mentions of the lag system were positive, every single one. We've got a very decent review score, 
out of a lot of reviews. This is, this is actually a shitload of reviews from Metacritic for a game of our size. Uh, to give you scale, um, uh, Witcher 3 had like 80 reviews for PS4 and 30 for PC. Uh, and we've got even better Steam user score, which is like halfway between XCOM 1 and XCOM 2. So why I believe it succeeded is that it was, it was a fresh idea to extract interest, because it sounds interesting. Uh, it was a simple concept that's easy to teach and a proper design that works well. Yeah. And that's that. It's, I would say that's, uh, it's as simple as that. And that would be the end of the first part of our presentation. Now we'll switch over to Pavel, who will carry on. Hello. <coughs> so let's go for something completely different. Uh, I will tell you a little bit about the DLC for Hard West. And basically, after the release of the vanilla game, I was bitching a lot about, you know, the various flaws that were uh, in Hard West. So when the DLC got the green light and Kasper said something along the lines of, you arrogant fool, if you think you can make it better, then make it better. And that's how I became the project lead on, on the DLC. And so I went through a process that was kind of similar to what Kasper did with analyzing XCOM and trying to find some flaws and ways to improve it. And so Hard West was a really narrative heavy game. We had like plenty of stories and but we had eight separate stories that initially had like no connection at all. And we made the risky move somewhere in the middle of the production to lump them all together into one epic plot. And so what helped us in this was that we had a very strong setting and we have the, all those supernatural elements that helped tie this thing together. We had a lot of themed mechanics like the luck, the concept of luck or fate, if you will. And we had those trick shots that really were evocative of, of the setting. And we had plenty of dark satanic powers or whatever. So it gave this setting uh, a feeling of consistency, even though the story was like really lumped together from different pieces. And we had an inexpensive presentation, which was mostly text-based, that allowed us to pull off this huge change in the middle of the production. But still, we had some problems. So I'm not sure if we were simply lucky with, with what we did, or maybe we had this very smart design that helped us pull it off. But anyway, uh, we had those characters because now we had like all the stories were linked. So we had some surplus characters that we didn't really need uh, narrative wise, but we needed them because perhaps the player killed this character off in an earlier episode. And we had some plenty of inconsistencies between the stories because some things worked one way in one scenario and like the next scenario the same thing worked totally different. Like we had demons that could spawn from hell, but in another scenario they would like masquerade as humans and only so there were plenty of such instances that things work differently between various stories and we had plenty of characters we had like six protagonists and we had a whole bunch of supporting characters but we had very very little characterization for those characters because we had the narrator who was like a completely emotionless guy who never utters who who's like speaks really in monotone and he was deaf so he knew everything but he spoke like this and was yeah very mysterious but it gave little characterization to the character to all the people that populated our stories and worst of all because each story was written separately uh, we had some plot twists that were kind of similar between one another and I'm not going to tell what they were but anyway, uh, when I sat down to outlining the story for the DLC, we had a pretty good idea of what we wanted to improve from the original game. 
and what we wanted to keep from the original game and what we wanted to add. So definitely we want to improve consistency basically by making, putting the story first and just have everything stem from the story because if this is a narrative heavy game, then we figured that maybe this should be like the top, the, the first thing, the first step from which we start everything else. I wanted to improve presentation, so basically add more characterization to, our, uh, to the characters of the story. And also a part of this put story first was to support the narrative with mechanics like we did in the original game because that worked really well for consistency. And since this was like an expansion and we wanted to try out something new, add something to the setting, so we really needed to have a new premise. And so I came up with something like this. So basically there is uh, Liberty, and the lady on the left, and she is an escaped slave. And she's badly injured, but she's found by this, uh, oh, spoiler alert. Yeah, too, too late, anyway. Yeah, so she's found by this Dr. Gorman, who is a really good surgeon, but he also is kind of a Dr. Frankenstein of, of the Wild West. And when he operates on her to save her life, he decides maybe he would uh, add some extra bits to make, to give her some super, superhuman powers. And she didn't like that very much. So basically this is what the, what the whole story would be about. And before I knew, it snowballed into defining the whole product, actually, because this one fairly innocent change in the story changed everything, well, maybe not everything, but changed many things that we took for, for granted from the original game. And so, uh, since we moved into more of a gothic horror setting, uh, this struggle between death and devil, which was purely supernatural and which was featured in the main game, was no longer valid because we were more, uh, this Dr. Gorman was more into science with an exclamation mark and liberty was more about being free and you know, not being oppressed. So this supernatural angle no longer made sense in this new premise. Instead of that, because liberty was now augmented with superpowers uh, due to you know having some extra limbs and body parts this body augmentation became a really big deal that should be central to the story and to the game and since be, since we no longer had this supernatural thing then death as a narrator no longer made sense and he was a perfect omniscient na narrator because he's this supernatural power and now we didn't have the supernatural so we had to contend with that in some way and so there were many there are many reflections of this in the game and in in the vanilla game we had this totally awesome uh, character development system where you would collect cards each card is an ability and you could put those cards uh, for each character and you could make poker hands out of them to get some extra bonuses. But, and this worked really well because it fit the setting in the original game and people, when they saw that, they automatically created some explanations like, for example, it's death playing poker with you or these are magical cards because they are from the devil or something. So this worked well and this was really liked by everyone, basically. And but it no longer fit this new premise. We had this gothic horror, we didn't have the supernatural, so those cards didn't fit just as well as they did in the original game. So even though this was an elegant design that everybody liked, it was no longer very fitting for this DLC. So we decided to change it, even though this was a pretty risky move. And we changed it, not very much actually. We only replaced the cards, the poker cards with uh, pictures of body parts. Like you can see, this is like bull's heart or something. So you could 
put those cards like you did in the original game, but instead of poker cards, they were body parts. And we said this is like transplanting those body parts onto your characters. And you could still make arrange them in some sort of um, combinations to get additional bonuses. And this also worked very well because people automatically started creating different explanations that this is, they have this image that you transplant body parts onto a character. And this was such a powerful image that they basically overlooked completely that this was more or less the same system that was in the original game, just reskinned into a new thing. So this worked, pretty, this worked out pretty well. And it also had the added value that now it wasn't about fate, it wasn't about luck, it wasn't supernatural. So you could plan for buying those body parts because in the original game you would get those cards randomly after a certain episode or after a certain battle, you would get like a bunch of cards and they were randomly selected from the pool. And now you had those body parts and there was a special shop where you could buy those body parts or you could walk around in the exploration phase and collect new body parts. And so you could strategically plan whether you want those upgrades or different upgrades, because of course you couldn't buy them all. So you could just develop your characters as you wished and not basically as the game allowed you to because you got some random cards. So this made this strategic layer a little bit more strategic. And with narration we had this, because we no longer had death, uh, he no longer fit, we no longer had the omniscient narrator and neither of our protagonists made good omniscient narrators because they were just ordinary humans. Uh, so we decided to scrap Death entirely, even though he was also liked. The actor was very good and you know the whole concept of this uh, mysterious supernatural guy telling you everything that happened. And we scrapped that in favor of of putting, giving our protagonist voices. We had two protagonists now. We had Liberty and Dr. Gorman, and each of them got their separate voice. They had different voice actors, and they would both tell their story. Liberty would tell one chunk of the story, and Dr. Gorman would tell the other part of the story. And uh, we basically, we only kept the retrospect. Like in the original game, you have death recounting past events just to create an image of some sort. And here we had those two characters talking to one another and they would explain their parts and their stories to one another. So this allowed is the improved characterization because since now they had voices, they could be more emotional, they could present some of their personal views so we could really make them stand out and be like more clear cut and, and be more characteristic than what we could achieve in the original game. And since we had two actors now, it added some variety to the game. So um, yeah, so these are some of the challenges that we had for the DLC and what we did with every one of them. So we had one scenario with a consistent setting from start to finish because it was planned that way from the start. We had um, improved presentation because now the characters had more characterization. Uh, we didn't have the narrator, the original one. We, it didn't make sense, but instead we made the protagonist narrators. We didn't have the supernatural angle, but we replaced all those fate-themed things with science-themed things. And we made use of the body augmentation as a theme by making it the character development system. And basically, that's it. So, thank you very much. Do you have any questions, maybe, or anything? Here is the mic, and here are the questions or comments. Um, this was the case study, so it's uh, difficult to um, just right away 
uh, ask any questions, but I'm sure that you have something in your mind. Yeah. Uh, hello, uh, thanks for the presentation and for the case study. So my question would be, um, don't you feel that um, it would be better to differentiate like in, the, uh, in terms of art and in terms of design the, uh, the augs that you introduced in the DLC? Because uh, from what I saw here, as you said, uh, uh, they both look like cards. So for example, I, I don't know, did you have an idea, for example, to split a character into five areas where you can place the augs in, just like they did, for example, in the Deus Ex games? Because the concept of uh, taking the cards off and uh, giving a good explanation of why are we using augmentations is very good, but I thought about the graphic presentation because from the screens you presented, they, they all look like uh, poker, car uh, poker cards and poker hands. So yes, but... Um well, obviously, yes, we actually um, thought about this and this was a no-go from the start actually because um, the interface, the GUI was like the, one of the most expensive things ever in production. So it was something that we just could not afford to do. So basically we had to um, like pretend that it was meant to be that way. <laughs> This is a good explanation, <laughs> I would say. Okay, um, anyone, any comments about uh, what you have seen? Or you want to want to share your thoughts about the process? Okay, um, so uh, I, will, uh, I will ask a question um, that I think that will wrap up somehow this session. Um, you showed us the, the, the process and um, um, uh, th let's say, this, I don't know if this is the proper word, but uh, some sort of struggle, uh, also uh, a lot of choices. Um, what is your ultimate um, rule when you make uh, uh, difficult choices when designing the game? So is there something like, what do you think about, um, I know that you have to think about money, <laughs> yep. and this is a, this is a good uh, designing um, you know, uh, constraint, but what is your, like, do you have any method for that, or this is just like uh, incorporated in the company some way? So actually, it's pretty simple. Well, giving given the example of of, of the lag system, uh, we had a huge set of problems that we wanted to solve. We digested in a lot of examples, a lot of movies and movie scenes and games, and replay them all. And you have to really let it sink in. You need time. You, let, you have to let it brew somewhere in the back of your head. It's like, I, have no, I don't know where, where, where this process is taking place, but definitely not in the conscious, you know? Uh, and eventually you have to come up with some solutions. You, you try them one by another, and it's, it's pretty quite, it's, it's really hard, hard work testing like a hundred of solutions until you find one that isn't not working because that's like the that you don't find the best one you find one that is working with all your constraints and then you're done okay. <laughs> yeah um and um and going closer to what i had in mind when is the moment when you think about the player so when is the moment that we, you meet the player or so do you assume that you understand what he needs or do you expect what he will need or do you have any method of meeting the player um checking with people who are potential players if your ideas are okay. So wh when is the moment when you meet the player in the whole process of game design? Okay, I guess it depends on, on the means you have available. Uh, in our case, we, uh, we, we tested a lot, of the, a lot of our solutions on people who work. Uh, with us. Tested on people, sort of like that. Yeah, yeah it's um, basically uh, when you have some shred of, of a solution, you try to present it to, um, to the other guys, get some feedback from, you know, from the company, and they will tell you like, oh, this is a totally awful idea, I, I hate it. Which is a point, <laughs> not, not necessarily a valid one, because it's, it seems after you know after making this game, we have like the impression that game developers have particular tastes and expectations which differ from from players. Like the general 
populace of the players, but on the other hand, there is, it's hard to find this general average player. There is like everyone has their expectations, and um, so yeah. I, to actually answer a question, it's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, it's very hard to meet the player unless you have like structures, like you know, bringing in some people from 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 the outside to to test your game, and it's never really um, like the the very confirmation that you're looking for. You have to play it on instinct a little bit or on your experiences, and that's I guess how you meet the player by trying to empathize with the player. Okay, I like the answer. So. Um, what I took from that is uh, you have you, you have to risk a bit. You have to uh, believe in your intuition uh, always, and uh, somehow empathize and imagine what's uh, what are the expectations. Because I understand that the budgets, the constraints are so high that it's difficult to have always the board of advisors, <laughs> average players. They yeah, are impossible right. to find. By the way, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Th does anyone have a question uh, at this moment? So now, please uh, join me giving thanks to our speakers, uh, to this case study. We